This week is the last week in this series of homilies that we've been doing on the Mass. And so in this, this homily, uh, we're going to talk about the, the last part of the Liturgy of the Eucharist. If you'll remember, last week we started the Liturgy of the Eucharist and we got through the end of the Eucharistic prayer. And then this week we'll cover the last part of the Eucharist, or the liturgy of the Eucharist, and then that fourth section of the Mass called the Concluding Rites, which is uh, the shortest part, uh, but very important still. <laughs> this last part of the liturgy of the Eucharist is called the Communion Rite. And in the Communion Rite, obviously we receive Holy Communion, but in this whole rite that starts right at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, uh, we express the communion that we have as the body of Christ uh, in a few different ways. And as we look, we'll see that that communion is expressed uh, kind of in a deeper way as we go from the start to the finish of this rite, of this ritual. So the first part of that communion rite is the Lord's Prayer. We pray the Our Father. We express uh, that idea and that reality right, that we, because of God's grace, because of God's love for us, we have the ability and the gift to call God our Father. And not just do we have the ability and the gift to do it, but we are commanded to do it. The priest reminds us, right, at the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, we lowly creatures, sinful men and women, dare, because of the love of God, to call God our Father. And I could do a whole... 45-minute homily just on the Our Father, but I won't today. <laughs> but that prayer, if you look at it, and maybe we'll do this at a certain point, but it's such a beautiful expression right, of prayer. It's, in many ways, the perfect prayer. It's the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray as the model for all of our prayer. And so we want to pray those words with intention. We want to pray those words thinking about what we're saying and the implications of what we're saying for our own lives. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are we open to that? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Are we forgiving our brothers and sisters? Because these are the things that we're asking the Lord to do. <laughs> but they imply something for our lives. Right? But as we pray this prayer... We are expressing the communion that we have vocally through our voices, right? There was uh, kind of a, a custom that happened uh, 50 years ago or so where uh, people would hold hands during the Our Father as a sign of the unity that we have praying that prayer. But really, that is not the time for it because in that moment, that unity is being expressed vocally, right? That unity is being expressed through our words, through our recitation together of the Lord's Prayer. After the Lord's Prayer, we have a little rite that we call the rite of peace. Right? The priest asks the Lord Jesus uh, to give us his peace as he promised, and he gave his peace to his apostles, right? And then afterwards, he's, the deacon or the priest says, let us offer each other the sign of peace. And now, that communion and that uh, unity that was expressed vocally is now expressed in a physical way. By turning to one another, giving a bow, a handshake to those closest to you. Right? That unity is expressed now physically in that sign of peace. And that peace is an important uh, idea. It's an important thing to think about and to pray for. Right? Because peace is not just the absence of war. Right? 
Peace is the proper ordering of everything. That's what peace is in our own lives. When everything in our life is properly ordered and oriented in the correct way, that's when we attain peace within ourselves. In other words, when everything in our lives is properly ordered to the Lord, for whom we were created, that's when true peace will reign in our hearts, when everything falls in its proper place and is directed where it needs to go to God, to heaven, to the one who created us for him so that we could be fulfilled. And so when we ask the Lord to give us peace, that's what we're asking for. We're asking him to reorder our lives, to reorder our priorities, to reorder our faculties toward him so that we can be solely focused on him. We can let go of our sins, we can let go of our weaknesses, we can let go of everything that distracts us from him and be focused and be ordered toward him. And then to help us do that, (laughs) he's about to give us himself, right? Body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. So right before we receive Holy Communion, We come to one of the few times in the Mass when we actually address our prayer to Jesus. Like I said several weeks ago, uh, 95% of all of the prayers that we say at Mass are directed to God the Father, right? Because remember, we're being drawn into the sacrifice of Jesus to his Father. And so our prayer is directed primarily to God the Father. But in this moment, we direct a prayer or a few prayers to Jesus himself. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Right before we receive Holy Communion, we ask twice for for mercy. (laughs) We ask that the Lord would forgive our sins, that he would look upon our lowly state And in his love for us, uh, remove the cause of our misery, which is our sin. And then again, we ask him for peace. Grant us peace. We ask him to reorient our lives toward him so that our hearts may be unified in seeking our fulfillment through him. And as that prayer is being prayed the priest uh, makes a little ritual action. He takes the host and he breaks it, and then he breaks off a little piece of the host and puts it into the chalice. And this is an important symbolic ritual action that signifies the resurrection of Jesus. Because... You know, we understand that in the Eucharist is, is the whole of Jesus. Right? We're not receiving uh, dead Jesus, in a sense, right? We're receiving the resurrected Lord who rose from the dead. Right? And when Jesus was hanging on the cross, a soldier pierced his side with a lance, and out of his side flowed blood and water. When Jesus died on the cross, his body and his blood were separated. The blood was removed from his body. But now, he's no longer dead. He's risen. His body and his blood are now united. They're no longer separate because he's alive. He's not dead. And so when the priest Prays that He prays a little prayer. He says, May this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. He asks the Lord that we too, through our reception of his body and blood, might have uh, eternal life, right? might have a share in his resurrection. And all of that's happening as 
you, the congregation, are singing the Lamb of God, asking the Lord for mercy, asking the Lord for peace, to reorient our lives to the Lord so that we can have that share in eternal life, so that we can be drawn into the mystery of his resurrection. So after that, the priest says uh, a little quiet, private prayer to the Lord, asking for particular graces for him, that he may be holy through his reception of of the Eucharist. And then he genuflects and he raises the host in the chalice, and he echoes the words of St. John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. This right here, again, as I've said over and over and over, is no longer bread. It's no longer wine. This is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. This is Jesus. This is God. And blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. That phrase, supper of the Lamb, is uh, an image taken from the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is, uh, in many ways, a a mystical vision that St. John had of heaven. And he describes it as a wedding feast, right? the wedding feast of the Lamb of God. And this image of a wedding is, has been used all throughout the history of the church to understand the relationship that Jesus has with his people. Right? The relationship of Jesus and the church. Right? Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride. Right? The church is the bride of Christ. And Jesus, as a loving husband, lays down his life completely for the church. He holds nothing back. He gives everything. And that's what we're called to. We're called to celebrate the fact that we have been brought into that relationship of Jesus in which he gives himself entirely to us and holds nothing back, not even his own body. And our response to that call, our response to the call to the Supper of the Lamb, to receive Jesus in the Eucharist, is a recognition of how unworthy we are. And we echo, again, more words from Scripture, the words of the centurion, who says, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. But only say the word and my soul shall be healed. In scripture, he says, my servant, right? Jesus is coming to heal a servant, to raise a servant to life, And this prayer hits at a really important reality for all of us. There's not a single person in this room right now who is worthy to receive the Eucharist. None of us are worthy of the gift that we're being given. Every single one of us is unworthy. (laughs) And yet the Lord in his love gives himself to us. He says, even though you are unworthy, I will make you worthy. (laughs) By my grace, by my love, by my word, by my choosing of you to be my child, my son, my daughter. I am making you worthy of this gift. What a beautiful reality that the Lord finds us who are so unworthy that he finds us worthy (laughs) through his love. He loves us so much that he finds us worthy to receive himself totally, completely, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. And that's really the last thing that we say before receiving Holy Communion. We recognize how unworthy we are, but we recognize the love of God. (laughs) That if he desires it, if he wills it, out of his love, He will heal our souls. He will make us worthy. And then we come forward. And this 
Communion procession, because that's really what it is, is a procession, is an important ritual action. Because what it kind of symbolizes is, in a way, our conversion. Jesus makes a motion, and we make a motion. Jesus comes from the altar to us, and we turn and come to the Lord. We recognize where I'm at in my life, where I'm at in my sin, is not quite good enough. (laughs) So I'm going to do what I can to come to the Lord, (laughs) to receive his grace, to allow him to transform me, to allow him to make me holy. And so we turn and we come forward to the Lord. We come to the altar of God to receive him. And the priest or the deacon or whoever is distributing communion says, the body of Christ. And our next word, our response, is perhaps the most important response you will ever make. (laughs) And it's just one word. Amen. That one word encompasses the entirety of our Christian life. That one word, amen, is a Hebrew word that has a Latin equivalent, which is fiat. And that word fiat is famous because it was uttered probably in Hebrew as amen (laughs) by the mother of our Lord at the Annunciation. When the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, you are going to be pregnant, you're going to bear a child, she'll call him Emmanuel, he will be the son of God. And her response was, fiat, may it be done to me according to your word. May it be done to me. May it be so. I believe, I understand, I assent, I affirm (laughs) the will of God. And when we say the body of Christ and we say amen, what we're assenting to is everything. (laughs) Because as we know, the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the whole Christian life. Everything in Scripture, everything in the teaching of the church, everything that is involved with being a Christian leads to and finds its source in the Eucharist that you're about to receive. And when we say amen to the body of Christ, we're saying yes to all of it. That's why, that's why in the Catholic Church, right, our understanding of the Eucharist leads us to not admit people who aren't Catholic to Holy Communion. That's why people who are in a state of mortal sin ought not to receive Holy Communion. That's why people who promote things that are blatantly against the Catholic faith ought not to receive Holy Communion. Because when we say amen, we're saying yes to everything. We're saying yes to the entirety of the faith. And if we don't believe the entirety of the faith, if we're not seeking with our hearts to live the entirety of the faith, (laughs) then when we say amen, we're lying. We're making a response that is untrue. And in doing so, we put our souls in danger (laughs) because we're lying to the Lord. (laughs) And it's never a good idea to lie to the Lord. (laughs) But when we say amen, Jesus gives himself to us. And the grace that we receive in that sacrament can transform our hearts. It can take any doubts, any uh, questions, any struggles, any weaknesses, and it can transform them into strength, into faith, into love, into holiness. Now, just a little bit of practical advice as you come forward for Holy Communion. (laughs) If you're going to receive on the hand 
place one hand on top of the other in a flat way. Don't angle it like this because then the host will fall off, right? Make it flat. And after you receive Holy Communion, check in your hand to see if there are any crumbs that were left behind. Right? Because each and every little crumb is still the Eucharist. As long as it can be recognized as bread, it's Jesus. <laughs> and we don't want Jesus falling on the floor to be stepped on and walked on. So if you're receiving in the hand, make sure that after you've received him in a flat hand, one of the fathers of the church says to make an altar for the Lord out of your hands. And then we receive him and check to make sure that there are no crumbs in your hand. If you're going to receive on the tongue, when you come forward, make sure that your tongue is outside of your mouth. <laughs> like that. <laughs> It looks a little silly, but that's okay. Most of the things we do look a little bit silly to the Lord. <laughs> if, you if you make your tongue stick out outside of your mouth, it's easier for us to place the host on your tongue without uh, being licked or without touching your lips or anything like that. Okay? So stick your tongue outside of your mouth, wait till the priest or the deacon puts the host on your tongue, and then pull it back into your mouth. Just a little bit of practical advice that we're, it's always helpful to be reminded of. Right? <laughs> so after we receive Holy Communion, you all go back to your pews and the, the song continues. And then after everyone's done, we come up here and we purify the vessels. It's really helpful to understand what we're supposed to be doing there. Right? <laughs> After we've come back from receiving Holy Communion and we're there in prayer, that is a time where Jesus is inside of you. You have just received God. You have just received your Lord and God into your body. And that's a time to pray in thanksgiving. To be with Jesus, to thank him for the gift of the Eucharist that he's given you to thank him for all of the other gifts that he's given you, and also just to sit and allow the Lord to work in your heart. Oftentimes when the Lord works in our lives, it's, it's kind of like surgery. Right? <laughs> we don't really know what's going on, but the Lord is working in ways we don't understand. And at some point, we're going to see the fruit of that work. Right? We're going to experience the healing. So it's a time to sit in thanksgiving, and it's a time uh, to allow the Lord to work in your heart. The other thing that's happening as that's going on is the priest is purifying the vessels, the priest and the deacon. And as he's purifying the vessels, again, for like the 15th time during Mass, the priest is saying a prayer that you don't hear. <laughs> and as he's purifying the vessels... He says, what has passed our lips as food, O Lord, may we possess in purity of heart, that what has been given us in time may be our healing for eternity. So again, as we're, as we're purifying the vessels, as we're cleaning the crumbs out of the saboria and the precious blood out of the chalice, uh, the priest is asking the Lord that he would purify all of our hearts so that we can receive the Eucharist with pure hearts and be given the gift of eternity, be given the gift of eternal life through our reception of the Eucharist, through our living out of the Christian life. And then after the, after the uh, purification, the priest comes back to the chair and there's a small uh, bit of silence, right? To, again, continue to enter into uh, that prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord, that time to open ourselves to his work in our hearts. And then, at that point, we move into that last part of the Mass called the concluding rites. So the liturgy of the Eucharist ends after uh, the purification of the vessels and when the priest comes and sits down. So now we enter into that last part of the Mass called the concluding rites. And there are um, three or four things that happen in the concluding rites. First, we say a prayer. 
We call it the prayer after communion because it happens after communion. <laughs> and this prayer is again for, uh, as, as we did in the collect and as we did in the prayer over the offerings, this prayer is asking for a particular grace. This prayer is asking for a grace, uh, particularly that we receive through our reception of the Eucharist. So it always references the communion that we just received and asks that the Lord would give us a particular grace through our reception of the Eucharist. And after we pray that prayer here at Blessed Sacrament, we pray the prayer to St. Michael, right? This is something that Archbishop Coakley has been encouraging us as parishes to do. Uh, it's, it's a custom that goes back probably a hundred years in the church. Um, that right at the end of Mass, we ask for the intercession of St. Michael that he would protect us from the evil one, from the attacks of the enemy, uh, and that he would help us to go towards God. Right? And so we do that right after that prayer after communion. And then we come to kind of the end of the Mass, right? <laughs> there's a final blessing. The priest blesses the people. And then there's a dismissal. And this dismissal is important. And I know I've talked about it before. And I most likely will talk about it again, right? <laughs> but when the deacon or the priest says, go in peace, or go forth, the Mass is ended, or go and announce the gospel of the Lord, or go in peace, glorifying the Lord with your life, he means that. <laughs> what that means is don't let all of the graces that you've received here stay here. All of those things that we've been talking about for the last eight weeks, all of those things that you were able to enter into and receive and you were transformed by them, don't let that transformation stay here in the church. Because the church is apostolic. We were given a mission. Right? Jesus gave the church a mission to go and to make disciples of all people. And when we come here and we receive the Lord, and we receive his grace, and we receive his transformation, and we receive his power, now we're called to go out and to share that with other people. To share it at work, to share it in our families, to share it in the grocery store, to share it in the bar, Wherever we go, <laughs> we are called to share the Lord with other people. And so we're dismissed. But even then, the Mass is not quite over. The Mass isn't over until we get out the door. <laughs> and this is important because just like the procession in at the beginning of Mass is a symbolic gesture of us coming from the world to the Lord on this pilgrimage to heaven, or this way of the cross, right? So too, the procession out is a symbolic gesture. That again, just like we were invited to do in the dismissal, that we take what we received here and we go out. And we share it. And so we do that. Right? And all throughout the Mass, hopefully we're praying for the strength to do that to not let Mass be an isolated thing that happens once a week and only in the church, but to allow the graces of the Mass to strengthen us, to transform us, so that we can go out and we can be the disciples that we were called to be, sharing what we've received here with the people who are out there. <laughs>